I'm not going to make you stand again, though the passage that I will be coming from is the same one. And I know you might be thinking, man, she's going to preach the same message. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> the perspective is a bit different than what Pastor A just powerfully shared with you. Um, I consider it when things are repeated, it usually means it's emphatic and that it's on purpose. So God saw fit for us to preach from this passage of scripture, not once, but twice, because there was something there he needed you to hear. So I'm here to share it with you. I will read it again for your hearing, and then we're going to dive right in. Um, for those that may not have heard what that passage was, it is Mark 10, verses 13 through 16. I'm reading from the New American Standard. Help Holy Spirit. And it says, And they were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms and began blessing them, laying his hands on them. And I would like to share from this thought and my contribution to the summertime playlist. Yes, Jesus loves me. You can take your seat. The lyric, little ones to him belong, comes from the common Sunday school song in him most of us know as Yes, Jesus Loves Me. It is a very simple song. It's probably why we teach it to children first. The song gives some simple truths about Jesus. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. And we all know the chorus of that song, right? Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. I'm not singing behind Pastor A. Like, we're not doing that. But yes, <laughs> Jesus loves me for the Bible tells me so. It even goes on to say, Jesus loves me, he who died. Heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Most of us have been singing this song our whole lives. It's a fun song to sing, but I don't know if we realize how much weight it holds. Jesus loves me, and this I know because the Bible, God's word, tells me so. I, as a little one, belong to Jesus. When I am weak, Jesus is strong. These are solid foundational beliefs about Jesus that we are singing as children, and even now as an adult, we get stirred thinking about the fact that he died for us and that heaven's gates are opening wide for us to spend eternity with him. Jesus has washed away all of our sin and has invited us into a shared space with him. However, how beautiful would it be if a child who is singing that song understood the gravity and the weight of its words? I will contend today that the tough reality is I'm not sure that they know how heavy those words are and that we as the adults are partially responsible. We have been keeping Jesus from them and keeping them from Jesus. We might be the very reason that they are being held back and maybe it's because we feel like we are protecting them from the troubles of this life and not having to call on Jesus. Maybe we think that they are just too young to understand. Maybe we don't know how to create the space and teach them about Jesus because when we were their age, the adults didn't make space for us. Regardless of the reason, the truth of the matter is, the only way that we are going to raise a generation of adults that know Jesus, love Jesus, and trust Jesus is by beginning now. Jesus is not someone that you have to look forward to getting to know. He is not a high priest that we have to wait to understand. Jesus is not waiting for us to be of age to understand him and all that he is and all that he has. For us, he desires us now. He desires our children now. 
This passage is going to help us explain. I hope you still have your Bible open because I'm just going to walk us through the verses. We're just going to walk the text. Let's just dive in. The passage that we read begins with the word and. Everybody say and. I don't know if y'all know I was a teacher by trade before I was ever a pastor. So you're going to talk back to me, okay? Um, And is a conjunction. It brings sentence fragments and sometimes even complete sentences together. This means that something else was happening while the events in our passage are going on as well. At the beginning of chapter 10, there is a crowd gathering, and verse 1 says that according to his custom, he being Jesus once more began to teach them. While the crowd is gathered at the beginning of this chapter, the topic of conversation being discussed is about divorce. While this sermon is not about divorce, I do not believe that it is by happenstance that a discussion about family comes right before a conversation about children. Their family, children's families, whoever it may include, it's important. It is similar to the nucleus of a cell. Everybody say nucleus. I taught science, by the way. The nucleus is the brain of the cell. It communicates to all of the other cell parts what their job is and sustains the overall life of the cell. The cell cannot operate without the nucleus. Children and youth need their nucleus. They need their families. They need their villages and their support systems no matter who they are made up of. And they need them to be supportive, affirming, encouraging, honest, accountable and loving it is not coincidence that a conversation about family is being discussed right before this conversation about children i imagine that while some of the conversation about divorce is still happening because it's ongoing people particularly parents are bringing their children to jesus so that he can touch them this stands out because i can remember being a child and i'm a church kid And my brothers and I had to be in church all the time. My parents said, not only are we going to go as often as the doors are open, but you're going to serve as long as you're there. So we went to Bible study. We went to Sunday morning service, Wednesday night service. We even sat in on rehearsals that didn't have anything to do with us. We were always there. And then we served everywhere. We were in the choir and on the praise team and on the drill team and on the step team and everything else that we can make time for or even make up should they ask us to. But now we have families that have granted children a little bit more autonomy, which, you know, isn't inherently wrong until we get to a spot where they say, I don't want to go to church and I don't want to serve and I don't want to be there. And you might at one time say, that's cool. But when tragedy strikes and when that baby goes wayward, you and that child are running to Jesus, hoping that he can turn around years worth of bad habits and turn them into obedience and submission. Friends, we cannot. We cannot. Or, or we as the adults in children's, lives, in children's lives sometimes can be guilty of gatekeeping Jesus and matters that concern him because we just deliberately refuse to engage our babies in a conversation about Jesus, thinking they're just too young and they're just not going to get it. That they will understand better by and by. I have a note here. If you're a note taker, this might be something to write down. Bring your young people to Jesus now. Don't wait. By only talking about Jesus when circumstances are needy, emergent, or when options are few, we are teaching them that a relationship with Jesus is conditional and quid pro quo. Also, the Greek word used here for children indicates little ones from infancy to 12 years old. I don't know if you caught that I'm your children's pastor, right? So I have those babies. I have another note for you. We cannot wait. For young people to become teenagers before we decided it's time for them to know Jesus, the time is now. And not just so that they can memorize all the verses and that they can share Jesus with another person, but because they need to be well equipped. There are things that your children are being faced with that are beyond your imagination. But this also shouldn't be a surprise to you, adult. Because at one point, you were once a child, you were once a teenager, 
And in those seasons of your life, you saw some things and you heard some things and you experienced some things that if it had not been for the grace of God, it had not been for a support system, no matter who that support system was made up of and they were praying for you and they were covering for you and they were standing in the gap for you, you wouldn't even be here to tell the story. So let's not keep Jesus a secret from our kids until we think that they are old enough to get it. Let's not keep Jesus a secret and then introduce him only when tragedy comes. Jesus' words in this passage help us to really understand why that's important. Y'all still tracking with me? All right. As people were bringing their little ones to Jesus, the, the disciples rebuked them. Say rebuke. Some other translations say that the disciples spoke sternly to them and turned them away. Rebuke means to express sharp disapproval of or criticism of someone because of their actions. I can only imagine the the expressions on the faces of the people standing there looking at the disciples, these men who follow and do, do ministry with Jesus that people look up to and watch them turn people and their children away from Jesus. I can only imagine the fear, the desperation, the exasperation, the anger, the frustration that they must have felt, the questions that they must have had. How is it that I'm trying to do right by my baby and bring them to Jesus and Jesus's people play the middleman? How often is it that people walk through the doors of our churches and desire Jesus and his people keep saying, you can come, but change your life first. You can come, but change your clothes first. You can come, but change your past first. You can come, but get on the right track first. Or they might even say, I can't let you bother God with that. That was your decision. Or that's not serious enough for God. One commentator said the disciples were abusing their authority by excluding some people from coming to Jesus, specifically those outside their circle and those who were regarded as unimportant by most people, which indicates that these were people that were turned away everywhere else. And when they looked for solace and safety in the one place they were sure they could get it, in the arms of Jesus, even there by his people, they were turned away it's not just the people but the children being turned away as well we've seen our babies turned away from church some of us might be guilty of being the very people to tell our children that they are not allowed to be here they don't say the right stuff they don't look the part they're not wearing the right stuff they're not talking right it's not enough they don't come from good families they're not preachers kids or they're not deacons kids sometimes we come up with all kinds of reasons to tell our babies that they're not allowed to be here but Jesus's words were clear in Matthew 11 28 through 30 come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find your rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light If the same parameters that we place on other people and children were in place at the time when we came to Jesus, I shudder to think about where we would be if we were here at all. The church should be a place where all, everybody say all, the church should be a place where all can come. The invitation has been extended and we as the church have to stop making people and children earn their place with Jesus. In verses 14 and 15, if you have a red letter Bible like me, all that is in red because that's Jesus is talking. Jesus felt a way about what was happening. The Bible says that he was indignant, say indignant. I'm having you repeat those words because they're important. Repetition means emphasis. Indignant is important. It is important for us to know that we serve a high priest who is not emotionless. He feels a way. Indignant means feeling or showing anger or annoyance at what is perceived as unfair treatment. Just in case you needed more evidence that the Lord does not agree with his people being unfairly treated. Here's some evidence in this passage right here. These children and the people who brought them to Jesus were being treated unfairly by people associated with him, and the Lord was not having it. He did not agree. He said, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, 
for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. This is what I imagine the Lord saying, let them come. Let them through. I will allow it. I encourage it. Do not hinder them. Do not prohibit them from coming. Do not prevent them from coming to me. Do not hold them back. Do not check them at the door. It's me that has called them. Let them through. Don't stand in their way. Don't tell them they don't understand yet. Don't tell them they can come to me later in their life when they've lived a little bit. Send them to me now because the kingdom belongs to them. Who are we to hold back our children from knowing their Jesus? Who are we to keep a secret that there is a God who can see them and hear their worries and hear their cries? Who are we to keep from them a God that loves them and did not make a mistake in making them the way that they are? Who are we to stand in the way between them and their miracle? Who are we to stand in the way between them and their prayer? Who are we let them come the Lord said the kingdom of God belongs to such as these the kingdom of God belongs to not just them but people like them the Lord made this a teachable moment y'all see that in there a whole master class on how we should approach Jesus and all we had to do was watch the children go to him the thing is as adults We've been living a little while. We've, been, we've experienced Jesus a little bit. And now our approach, I believe, has kind of lost its way. We oftentimes approach Jesus with a little bit more skepticism rather than faith and trust. We have all the questions. Who all going to be there? Where are we going? What are all the options? What if I say no? What if I say yes? What if I can't do it? What if you're not there? What happens if I fail? Or we might be guilty of taking inventory of prior experiences and determining that God works in a pattern and we can predict his actions. That somehow we know how God will respond or we now know what to do and now we don't need God to step in and do it because we feel like we can do it ourselves or we're afraid that he won't do it the way I like to do it or the way that I want it done or to produce the outcome that I desire so I take matters into my own hands and do it or he just... We get to a place where we trust our own vices and trust the work of our own hands instead of looking to Jesus. But children are another story. On the other hand, they are often trusting even without all of the information. They live their lives like they are invincible because they know that no matter what, someone is going to be there to save them. They are resilient. They adapt. They are hopeful. They already know that they can't do everything that they put their minds to and that they need help. So they are quick to ask and they know who to ask. They are quick to receive gifts without question or without apprehension. They understand where their shortcomings are and not embarrassed by them or ashamed of them. We have to be willing to be like children. They go to the one place with the one person that they know can take care of them, and they do it every time, over and over again. It's interesting that we as adults spend so much time telling children that they have to grow up and mature because the world is a dangerous and wild place. And listen to me, it is a dangerous and a wild place. Pastor A just reminded us, it's ghetto out here. But the Lord's approach and solution to the world being a wild place is to approach it like that of a child and not like that of an adult, which means we know that there is a solution to whatever might be plaguing us. No matter how big it is, the answer is always bigger. It's bigger than we are, and it's bigger than what our problem is. The answer is Jesus. The world is full of uncertainty. We got to go to the one place where we know we're going to get an answer. That place is Jesus. The world is full of hurt. We got to go to the place where healing is. That place is Jesus. The world is full of danger. We have to go to where protection is. That place is Jesus. The world can leave us anxious. We have to go to where peace is. That place is Jesus. The world can be hurtful. We have to go to where comfort is. That place is Jesus. Children know where they can 
get their help and when they need it. Nothing stands in the way of them going to get it. And that's how we have to be with Jesus. Y'all with me? Here's the best part of this message. You do know that you also are a child of God. I know we hear, we hear on SLI, Kids Point You Sunday, and we talk and we're highlighting all of our babies. Yes, but you do know, adult, you do know parents, you do know guardian, you do know aunt and uncle and grandmother and grandfather and random passerby in the store standing in line with children running around. You do know that you also are a child of God. You also are a child of the Most High King, a child of our Lord and Savior. So all of these truths apply to you too. All of these expectations apply to you as well. Excuse me. So yes, stand aside and let your baby come to Jesus, but also come to Jesus. Yes, don't be a barrier between your child and the Lord. And yes, let nothing stand in your way of going to Jesus. Yes, allow the Lord to touch and embrace your child, but also the Lord wants to embrace you. Yes, the Lord wants to open up the windows of heaven for your child, but also he wants to give and pour out to you. Yes, train up a child in the way he should go, even when he he is old, he will not depart from it. But also, he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Yes, your child is fearfully and wonderfully made, but also you are fearfully and wonderfully made. The encouragement here, friends, is that you can show and talk to your children about the Lord, not from what you've been told, not from what you've been taught, but from your life right now, from what you are experiencing from Jesus right now. His truths apply to you. Don't allow life's pressures and difficult situations to to impact and keep you from introducing your gift from heaven to the gift of heaven. We're in verse 16. I'm, I'm about to let you go. We see that Jesus took the children up in his arms and he blessed them. He laid his hands on them. He embraced them. Everybody say embrace. It was a sign to everyone there that Jesus cares about and values the lives of children. Sometimes, I'm, I learned through this passage, it takes a person of power to tell us what's valuable and what isn't. Yeah. Sometimes it takes people in positions of power to demonstrate to us what we should and should not value. Note, it shows us that there may be someone out there taking their cue from you on how we are supposed to treat our children. They are learning from you and learning from me and learning from Pastor A how we are supposed to care about our children. Someone is always watching and someone is always learning no matter how we feel about it. So let's learn from what Jesus did and how he treated children just in this brief passage. If Jesus is willing to embrace the children and bless them, how much more then should we bless and embrace our children? If Jesus is willing to make space for our children to come and learn and sit with him and glean from him, how much more then should we make space for our children to come and learn and sit and glean from Jesus? If Jesus is willing to be bold and open about the valuing the life of children, and how much more then should should we be bold and open about valuing the lives of children? We cannot assume that kids just know how we feel about them. We cannot assume that children just know that their life is valuable to you. You don't assume that the people that are around you and care about you care about you. You don't make that assumption. You request proof. You need receipts. You need to know so by, by way of someone's words and by way of their actions that they actually care about you. Our children need that same proof. They need evidence of the love that you have for them, the blessings that you have, the embrace that you have, your words of affirmation, your acts of service, the structure you've set for them, the protection you have of them, the accountability of their wrongdoing, the humility you need for them to have. They need to know that you value them and care for them enough, not just to show it to them, but to show it to the world at large. There has to be a reason why Jesus stepped out of heaven and began his life as a child and not as an adult. 
He could have chosen to be 33 the whole time. But instead, we get the privilege of knowing a Jesus who knows what it means to be a child. Aren't you glad that we serve a high priest who empathizes with you and understands every season of your life? Little did we know that he understands the childhood part of your life, the youth part of your life, the teenage part of your life. He knows what it means to have a support system in a family and knows what it means to have a relationship with his father in heaven. God made space for Jesus to grow and demonstrate obedience obedience and trust in God and teach others to do the same. Even in his childhood, he obeyed God. He trusted God. He leaned on his word. It was because of what he experienced through his childhood that he could depend on him in his youth. And it was because of what he experienced in his youth that he could depend on God in his adulthood. That dependence, that trust prepared him for a future of saving the world that he otherwise may not have been prepared to save had he not had a history with God as father that began when he was young but because God made space for Jesus' childhood and youth to know God and to be known by God and to be loved by God he was ready to save you and me from what we couldn't save ourselves from he was able to live his life perfectly he was able to save you from your sin and also create space for you to have direct access and a closer relationship with your father in heaven listen to me friends child of God no matter how old you are Jesus died for you child of God no matter how old you are Jesus is alive for you child of God no matter how old you are come to Jesus I'm gonna say it again child of God no matter how old you are come to Jesus the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who trust God with no restraint with no boundary with no barrier child of God don't hold back don't prohibit yourself or your children from coming to Jesus why because Jesus wants you and Jesus wants your babies and Jesus wants your children Jesus wants your teenagers let them come to Jesus and you come to Jesus with them